Now the point is you are discussing this velocity and you are talking about the free electron. Now let's look at this in a bit more detail. If I have a conductor with a piece of wire and some temperature, you have free electron in the presence of this free electron. Now when all of those electrons have the same velocity, no they will not. They will be moving with different velocity. Now if I plot the velocities of those electrons on this axis I have the velocity of the electrons and on this axis I have a frequency or I have the number of electrons with velocity g since the electron the velocities are vector the velocities will be pointed in random directions so if I take an average over just a conductor at some temperature, no extraneous radiation. Now, if I were to plot this graph, that is, if I take some B, B, and I would like to find out the number of electrons that have this B, I will get what is called a histogram. So, if I plot this histogram, does anyone know what the histogram will look like? It's going to be a Gaussian distance.
So this is zero speed. I'm talking about the speeds so far, okay? And this is some speed, a very high speed, 1000 kilometers per second, depending upon the temperature. I call this V-thermal. And there are electrons that are moving at speeds around this average speed, okay? And the number of electrons will be determined by this Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So there are electrons moving with speeds slightly higher, then the electron suffers a collusion, it changes its speed. A new speed is acquired, a new direction and a new speed is acquired after the collusion. So the new speed can be smaller than the thermal speed and it might go longer without suffering a collusion. Then it changes its speed again. But its speed between collusions remains constant because there is nothing that's going to accelerate the electrons. There's no electric field applied. So it continuously changes its speed, suffers collusions, And on average, the speed of this single electron, if you look at it over time, is going to be equal to the thermal speed. Okay? If your time of observation, time of observation is much larger than the average lifetime of the electron, that is the average time between collisions. If you look long enough, then the average speed, if you take the average of all of these speeds, it's going to be it's going to approach the thermal speed. And this is a very high speed. This is about 1000 kilometers per second. Okay? So this is what's happening in the absence of an electric field. Now even though the average speed is really high, if I look at the average velocity, it's going to be zero. Because these speeds, I cannot plot the speeds on this, uh, the directions on this graph. I can only plot the speeds. So if I can somehow plot the directions as well, I would get an average vector which is zero. And the best way of making such a plot is through this diagram, the showing the trajectory of the electron. So if I look at all of these vectors and take the resultant, it's going to be zero, no matter how big these speeds are. Okay, so this is a plot of the average speed versus time of an electron inside a metal that is not experiencing an electric field and there's no current so the average velocity is zero and if the average velocity is zero there can be no current density so current cannot flow inside the conductor so there can only be current if the average velocity is non-zero g so in the last class the graph about the the field apply let's move on now what's going to happen is that you apply an electric field, okay? Now in the presence of an electric field, the velocity of an electron equals the initial velocity of the electron and we take the initial time to be the time of the collusion because we are at liberty to choose any initial time we like. Let's choose the time at which a collusion occurs minus the charge on electron, now we're talking about electrons, so I put a minus E over M T and the applied electric field which is a vector. Okay, so this is an equation that we derived earlier, it's just the Newton's laws of motion. You apply an electric field, E times E is the force, force times divided by mass is the acceleration, acceleration times time is the change in momentum. So what the electric field is doing is it's increasing the momentum of the electrons. But with the caveat that these electrons are undergoing collusions. So it boosts its momentum, boosts its velocity and then it resets. Whenever a collusion occurs, it resets. It changes its course, changes its speed and it always starts off with a new speed. And the speed with which it starts off is going to be hovering around this thermal speed in some arbitrarily new direction. Okay? So if we take the average of both sides, the average speed of the single electron, which is also going over time, which is also going to be the average speed of all the electrons if you take a snapshot at one point in time, because of statistics, is going to be the average of this. Now this is a vector, the average of this is zero, because this is just the thermal velocity. And it's pointing arbitrarily in random directions. So the average velocity of an electron 
in the presence of an externally applied electric field is going to be minus E over M. The average time between collisions is tau into the electric field. So this is the average speed, average velocity of an electron when placed inside an externally applied electric field. Okay, let's look at the, what's happening here. Now, I can model my electrons, the free electrons as a gas of electrons, okay? Now, suppose there is no applied electric field. I draw many electrons and I represent these electrons by points. Okay? Now, these are electrons that are moving around in this container, which is bounded by the surface of the metal. Now, if I look at the velocities of these electrons at one point in time, I take a camera and I take a snapshot of the velocities of these electrons, I get velocity vectors that are randomly pointing in different directions. All of them will have different lengths as well, but the average length will be equal to the thermal speed. So, I have a velocity vector here, a velocity vector here, velocity vector here, velocity vector here, here, here. And the average length of these velocity vectors is just going to be equal to the thermal speed. So this is the electric field zero case. Okay. So this is a snapshot of the electrons. Now let me redraw the same figure. Now what I do, I apply an electric field on this on this metal. So this is the case when the electric field is zero, the average velocity is zero. So if I take all of these vectors, the velocity vectors and I get the resultant, what's that resultant going to be? Again, field zero at the resultant kya hoga inka? Zero. Now I apply an electric field. Now the role of the electric field is that to each velocity, to each velocity, it adds this vector. Okay? So, each electron sees the same electric field. So, on average, each electron will suffer, will undergo a boost in its velocity. Its velocity will change. And its velocity will going to change according to this relationship. Now, if I apply my electric field in this direction, this is the direction of my electric field. Then the velocity vector is going to point to the right because it's a negatively charged electron. Okay, so this velocity component will add to the individual velocity vectors. Okay, and okay. Now let's look. Let's estimate an order of magnitude of this quantity. The thermal speeds are really high, thousand kilometers per second. If I take a conductor that is of length one meters. I apply across it a potential of 1 volt. I can find out the electric field in this conductor is just 1 volt per meter. Okay. We know the charge on an electron, we know the mass of an electron. The average collisional time between electrons is of the order of picoseconds. A millionth of a microsecond, a thousandth of a nanosecond. Now, if I put in these values, the average speed is turning out to be of the order of millimeters per second. Just millimeters per second. Compared to the thermal velocities, this is snail's pace. This is the of the thousand kilometers per second, say electrons move in the absence of an electric field. And when you impose an electric field, the additional velocity that each electron acquires is just a sluggish millimeters per second. Okay, so these are really big uh, vectors. Now to each vector, I will have to add a small velocity component opposite to the electric field because it's a negatively charged electron. So this is a big vector, 1000 kilometers per second. And to each of these, I add a small velocity component. And this is also an exaggeration because this is millimeters per second. This is kilometer, thousands of kilometers per second. So I can only do an exaggeration here. So to each velocity vector, I can add a small velocity which is directed. The only difference is that these blue arrows which represent the additional velocity due to the electric field 
these are directed they are in a certain preferred direction and the direction is imposed by the direction of the electric field so to each of these big velocity vectors i am adding a small vector in the opposite direction to the electric field and all of these small vectors the only thing is that they are directed they are in a particular direction because the electric field applies a force in a particular direction to each individual electron so there is a thousand kilometers per second velocity vector and on top of it there is a few millimeters per second or centimeters per second directed velocity this directed velocity is also called the drift velocity vd <coughs> now if i were to draw these electrons again <coughs> in the presence of an electric field agar main ab velocity vectors resultant velocity vectors banau to kis tarah ke dikhenge bilkul original velocity vector se tiny nudge towards the right towards the right okay the resultant is just nearly equal to the to the original velocity vector with a tiny nudge towards the right okay so this resultant will tinyly shift towards the right just tinyly and in fact if i draw this properly i will see no perceptible change okay it's just going to be similar to the original looking at it visually i will see no perceptible difference because the original velocity vectors are so high and the tiny bias or this bias that i have added bias ka matlab a preferred direction is so small that i will see no perceptible difference from the original velocity distribution but there is a tiny preference and that tiny preference this drift velocity determines the current density so the current density is going to be given by n q vd right now vd n q this vd is now equal to this so instead of q i can write e because i'm talking about electrons e Square tau over m electric field J. And the current density for when we talk about electrons is in the opposite direction to the electric field because the electrons experience a force that's in the opposite direction to the electric field. So this is. how the current density changes with the electric field i multiply this with the cross sectional area i will get the current so now it appears that the current is the magnitude of the current equals n e square tau over m the cross sectional area into the electric field so the current now depends upon the electric field inside the conductor and both of them are parallel this velocity vector is this electric field is parallel to the velocity vector so the current has to flow in the same direction the conventional current has to flow in the same direction as the electric field but what we've learned in electrostatic conditions there is no electric field inside a conductor so if i look at at a conductor which is twisted okay this is a wire of copper perhaps and a current is flowing through this wire okay if the current is uniform suppose it's a positively charged carrier say an elect say some positively charged carrier flowing through this or i can even talk about electrons let's talk about electrons now if there there are electrons everywhere and the electrons are moving with the drift velocity with a very small speed an extremely sluggish speed okay 
so the electrons are moving in a certain direction so these pink vectors represent the velocities of the electrons at different points in the conductor and these velocity vectors make up a current whenever there is velocity there is a current so there is velocity of the electrons along this conductor and parallel to the axis of the conductor I twist this conductor the velocity vectors change why I'll explain that now this necessitates the fact that at each point there is an electric field inside the conductor a non-zero electric field because without the electric field the electrons cannot acquire a velocity a non-zero average velocity so the electric field here now drawing the electric field in blue is opposite to the direction of the velocity so the electric field here is in this direction the electric field here is in this direction here it's in this direction in this direction so the blues are representing the electric fields so there is electric field throughout the length of the conductor and the direction of the electric field follows the direction of the tubing and there is a non-zero electric field inside the conductor only a non-zero electric field can allow the, a current to flow so whenever a current flows through a conductor it's an out of equilibrium situation the charge carriers are not in equilibrium they are flowing through the conductor and there exists a non-zero electric field inside the conductor <coughs> Now this speed is really small. The pinks represent the, the drift velocities and the blues represent the electric fields. Now the point is that if electrons have to flow from this point to this point, if I turn off the lights and turn them back on, it just happens instantaneously. Even though the power source could be in Tarbela, about say 500 kilometers from here and the average velocity of the electron the drift velocity which is directed which is giving rise to a current is just centimeters per second so how could electrons flow all the way from Tarbela to SSE in just the fraction of a second this is something we'll have to explore the velocity which contributes to current is really small but something else is happening here which is causing the bulbs to light up so instantaneously okay do you understand this question does anyone have a have an answer to this question G. actually the electrons are not moving but when the external field is applied the field is carrying the energy and the energy is lighting up the bulbs so the, the, the field moves with the speed of the light so instantaneously when you switch up the Buzz, uh, this activity, the field is established and that field carries the energy and the light of the bulb. Because it's not possible for the electrons. So the electrons will not move at all? The electrons will move the drift velocity, so it's not possible for them to move from the velocity in just a fraction of a second. Right. So it's the redistribution of the electric field inside the conductor that's happening at the speed of light, which is causing the effects of the current to be felt at such high speeds. So if I have a metal piece I can model the drift velocity in the following way suppose the, the sea of electrons the sea of electrons inside the metal is throughout the metal okay so if I don't draw the ionic cores <coughs> all of this is just the sea of electrons <coughs> Okay? So the sea of electrons is contained with, within the boundaries of the metal. Now I apply an electric field in this direction. All of the electrons will on average move with this drift velocity. It's average because this is an average time. right? This is an average time between collisions. Remember that. All of the electrons will not move with the drift velocity. There will also be a distribution of those velocities. But the average is tau. So I apply an electric field, this sea of electrons, all of it is going to move together with the speed of a millimeters per second, the drift velocity. So this entire sea of electrons is going to move 
in the rightwards direction with a certain speed. Okay, so if I have a potential difference here which creates an electric field, then this entire sea of electrons will majestically move all of it towards the right with the speed which is millimeters per second. So it's not the individual motion of electrons. The entire sea is moving. This is not one layer in the water. The whole water, the Arctic Ocean, Antarctic Ocean, Atlantic Ocean is moving. The ocean is moving. The ocean is moving. The ocean is moving. The ocean is moving. So the entire ocean is moving with the speed of millimeters per second. So the entire sea of electrons is going to slosh forward, it's going to majestically move forward with the speed of 1 millimeters per second. And since electrons can't jump out of this conductor, there will be a higher majority of electrons that will stick to this side, giving it a positive net charge. And the sea of electrons has moved away from this end, so there will be a negative charge that will build up on this side. And this entire sea will move with the speed of one few millimeters per second. Okay, so this is the drift velocity, but this is not causing the bulb to light up. Because what's happening in a circuit, as we learn, is that the electric fields readjust themselves because there are electrons everywhere. So an electron here, if it sees a new electric field, it can readjust itself instantaneously, just at the speed of light. Okay, now, what I would like to talk about now is I would like to take this further, then we have a few demonstrations. I would like to highlight what is meant by the Ohm's law. Now, if I look at this expression, this expression, should I, this expression, this is just the Ohm's law. Okay, so this is the Ohm's law. Now it looks very unfamiliar because the Ohm's law is given by V equals I R, but I will show that it's equivalent to V equals I R. Now this quantity here, this quantity here, okay, tells me if I apply an electric field, how much current density do I get? Now the electric field is at a point, okay, different regions can have different electric fields. Inside this conductor, however, if there is a uniform current, the magnitude of the electric field has to be the same across the conductor, if the current is uniform. Okay, if it's non-uniform, of course, the electric field will also change. Now, if I apply a certain electric field inside a conductor, how much current does it produce? So the one that I've written in a blue bubble, is called the conductivity of the material. Okay, so I can write J equals sigma E, where sigma is, if I'm talking about electrons, it's minus N E square tau over M. Okay, this is called the conductivity of the material. Okay, it's just a constant proportionality, it depends upon the material and the charge carriers. You talk about electrons, this is the mass of the electron, the carrier density of electrons, the charge of the electron and the average collisional time. So it depends upon the material which is conducting. And this material property is conductivity. If I take 1 over sigma, it's called the, the resistivity, not the resistance. The inverse of the conductivity is called the resistivity. Okay. Now let's look at this expression. Okay. This I have multiplied by both sides. This expression came. Okay. Now if I have this conductor and the electric field is E and the potential difference across A and B, which is V. A minus VB and VA is higher. So this is at a higher potential. However, if I'm talking about electrons, this is at a higher potential. So I put VB minus VA. 
because I am talking exclusively about electrons. This is positive, this is at a higher potential because the electrons are attracted towards the higher potential. This Vp minus Va, this is delta V, let's call this delta V. The electric field will be delta V over the length of this conductor, the curved length of this conductor, okay? So this curved length is L. So E is delta V over L. Now if I plug this expression for the electric field in here, what do I get? I get I equals N E square tau over M A delta V over L. Now if I take delta V to the other side, delta V equals I L over A M N E square tau. On curly. Okay? So this is the potential difference across the across this wire equals the current times some object. That object has two parts. Two, first part is the geometrical factors, the length and area of this conductor. And the other part is the property of the material. Now all of this, this of course is called the resistivity. Right? This is 1 over the conductivity. So this is just the resistivity. It's a property of the material. So what I have is delta V equals I, the resistivity L over A. Now L over A is just the property of the conductor. It's the geometry of the conductor. This object, rho L over A, is called the resistance, capital R. And it depends upon the size of the object. Depends upon the length, the area. So this equals IR. And what's this? This is your familiar form of the Ohm's law. So from a microscopic perspective, we have derived, in one sense, the Ohm's law. So this is derivation of the Ohm's law. And this model was proposed in the 1880s by a British scientist called Drude. It's called the Drude's model. Ohm's law is not really a law like the Newton's law. It's it's an empirical observation that the current is always proportional to the potential difference. Okay, now what's the difference between resistance and resistivity? Could you tell us the difference in qualitative sense? Mein kya difference hai? Ab Okay, so resistance is an extensive property, resistivity is an intensive property. Like mass depends upon how big an object you have. But the density does not depend upon how big an object you have. So the density is an intensive property whereas mass is an extensive property depends upon how big an object you have. Now if you look at the resistance, this rho, the resistivity, would depend upon these factors. It depends upon the mass of the charge carriers, the number of charge carriers per unit volume, the uh, charge on a carrier and the average time between collisions. Now if I just focus on the resistivity, now which means R is inversely proportional to 1 over N tau, okay? Alright, now for a wire that is carrying current, you put in an electric field which is applied through a potential difference through a battery, it doesn't change the charge carrier density because new carriers are not created. These are just the free electrons that have been ionized from the atoms and you cannot create more free electrons unless your field goes to really high to the value of the second ionization potential if you're talking about the alkali metals. Because you, one alkali metal, one sodium atom will just donate one electron to the sea of electrons. If you want the second one out, remember you have an argon atom which is a noble gas configuration. The second ionization potential is going to be really high. 
So unless you apply a really high electric field, you cannot create additional free electrons inside the metal. Okay? So generally when we talk about metals and we talk about reasonably sized electric fields, this N does not change. Okay? Now if I increase the temperature of, of a metal, now what does increasing the temperature do to the metal? So it does two things. It increases the thermal velocity. It increases the thermal velocity by a square root T relationship. Or You said that when you apply the electric field, the small drift velocity is applied. But when you are magnifying your thermal velocity, that drift velocity will have a very, very small impact, even smaller impact. The drift velocity will not depend upon the temperature. The net, the net effect on it. No, even, even, okay, remember, even if you have a big electric field, even if you have a big electric field, what's going to ha happen to the average thermal velocity? Nothing. So the thermal velocities will, on, will increase. But the average speed will go up. But the average velocities will still not increase because the thermal velocities of the electrons are undirected. However, if you increase the temperature, what's going to happen as far as current is concerned is this tau. This collisional time is going to decrease. Because what happens is that the electron is seeing ionic cores. There's an ionic core. Suppose there's an electron that is moving with a certain velocity, which is a combination of the drift velocity and the thermal velocity. Now, if the temperature of the solid goes up, this is a harmonic oscillator. It has an equilibrium position and it is connected to neighboring atoms. So you can model this ionic core as being connected with springs to neighboring atoms in three dimensions. This is what is called an Einsteinian solid. Einsteinian solid. If you increase the temperature, the energy that you give to this ion is also going up by half kBT. So it will oscillate with a higher amplitude. Now what this ion is doing, it is presenting a target for collision to the electron. Okay, and there is a certain cross-sectional, effective cross-sectional area of a target that it presents to the electron. Now if it oscillates with a higher amplitude, the target the electron sees is higher. So there is a higher likelihood of collusion. So the average time between collusion is going to decrease. So if I increase this temperature, this target will increase. The target area which is called in solid state physics the cross section of this interaction. If the temperature goes up, this target area is going to go up because the amplitude of oscillation is going to increase. So the likelihood of this electron being colliding or interacting with this ion, which is called a collusion, is higher. So this electron will suffer collisions on average more frequently. So this time between collisions, the average time between collisions is going to drop if the temperature goes up. And if the temperature goes up, this is going to drop, the resistance is going to go up. So this is what happens in conductors or metals which are not affected by the carrier density. Now what I have here are, is, is, a, is a demonstration for you for this fact. Okay. <clears throat> now what we have here is a power supply. Okay, a power supply here. Let me turn off the lights a bit.
and I have here. Can you all see? Here what I have is a bulb, a normal bulb, a 12 volt bulb from an automobile, from a motorbike. Now what I do is I apply a voltage to this bulb. So there's a circuit, there's some wire that is going in. There's a long length of wire that has actually been made inside this probe. So I turn on the power supply. Okay. Okay, can you see it glowing? It's a feeble glow, a really feeble glow. It's actually glowing with really feebly. Let me have a close up. Right? There's a really feeble glow. Can you see? Okay. Now what I would like to do is camera thoda sa idhar liye okay. Yani ke sir mera dekho na aap wo light ke upar karoge na कोई बात नहीं चलो उधर ही रहो कोई खैर है ये मल्टीमीडिया ऑफ हो गया चलो ठीक है अभी ये ग्लो नजर आ रहा है हल्का सा वो इसलिए नजर नहीं आ रहा है क्योंकि बैकग्राउंड में लाइट है देखो आप ग्लो नजर आ रहा है हल्का सा इधर है ना ठीक है ठीक है नाउ व्हाट आई वुड लाइक टू डू आई वुड लाइक टू पुट दिस इन लिक्विड नाइट्रोजन ओके ना हाउ वुड आई डू दैट ये इस ए, इसको वहां वहां तक तार तो नहीं पहुंचेगी Okay, now I'm going to insert the wire inside liquid nitrogen, and let's see what's going to happen to the glow. Glow, is it coming? Okay. Okay. Let me try. Now, try to focus on it. Okay. Now it's a very feeble glow. Those who are in the front can actually see this. Now just insert this inside the liquid nitrogen, and the glow goes up. Can you see the glow now? It's so markedly different from the glow at room temperature. Really visible glow. In fact, you can see it without the camera, probably. <laughs> oh, this is nice. So I haven't changed the potential difference. I haven't changed the voltage. Only I changed the temperature. So this is an example of heating by cooling. 
because I'm actually heating the filament of the bulb by placing it in a colder environment. Isn't it so? I've placed this wire inside liquid nitrogen and by placing the wire inside the liquid nitrogen, I have decreased its resistance. The decrease is determined by the temperature coefficient of resistivity. It's a negative temperature coefficient of resistivity. The temperature goes up, the resistance goes down because the scattering coefficient, the scattering time increases. Now, this is glowing in full bloom. I take this out from the liquid nitrogen and you will see the glow go back slowly because it's cool and it takes time to come back to its room temperature value. So I take this out of the liquid nitrogen diluent. And the glow will slowly, slowly, slowly diminish. Okay, and if I would like to, okay, let me just put this cap back on the liquid nitrogen. What I would now like to do is I would like to heat up this. demonstrates that the resistance indeed depends upon temperature. Now I have another demonstration and this shows not a conductor but a different kind of material which has a negative temperature coefficient. Now what I have here is थेली के ऊपर देखें आपको एक ब्लैक मटेरियल ब्लैक मटेरियल नजर आ रहा होगा ठीक है इट्स अ बीड ऑफ अ सर्टेन मटेरियल व्हिच इज नेगेटिव टेंपरेचर कोएफिशिएंट इट्स मेड अप ऑफ अ सेमीकंडक्टर नाउ फॉर दिस मटेरियल इफ आई इंक्रीज द टेंपरेचर द कैरियर डेंसिटी इज गोइंग टू इंक्रीज एन इज गोइंग टू इंक्रीज इफ द टेंपरेचर गोस अप सो व्हेन दिस टेंपरेचर गोस अप एन गोस अप Tau is decreasing, but the effect of n going up is higher, so the resistance is going to decrease. Now, if I look at this material, and if you look at the reading of the resistance, it's about 2.1 kilo ohm, right? Now, if I just hold this material in my hand, its temperature goes up because it's seeing the body temperature, 37 degrees centigrade. Its temperature goes up, the resistance also goes up. Okay? Or ab men is the resistance goes down because it's cooling back to the temperature of the environment. Now I have a demonstration here which actually shows this effect more clearly. What we have here is a beaker of water. I place this on a hot plate. And I place this negative temperature coefficient material inside the beaker of water ok 
Okay, can you see this bead inside water? Okay. What close up the Okay. So I placed it in water. I placed this beaker on a hot plate and I insert the thermocouple which measures temperature inside this beaker of the water. So now I have two objects. I have oops. I have a thermocouple. This is my thermocouple which is measuring the temperature. This is my thermistor. Okay. Okay, so now there's a thermocouple and there's a certain temperature, 27 degrees centigrade, this is the temperature of water and there's a certain resistance, 2.7 kilo ohms. Okay, this is the resistance of this material at the temperature 28 degrees centigrade. Now I, I start up the heater, I turn on the heater. Okay, so the object starts to heat up slowly, slowly. If I would like to accelerate the heating, it's a slow process. I would like to put in a, a stirrer. I would like to stir this object. Now what you observe, now you the temperature of the temperature. Can you show these two? Let me turn off the light slightly. It says it's backlit. Hai. So the temperature has gone up to 29 degrees centigrade. Here is the temperature 29 degrees centigrade. The resistance has dropped from 2.5 to 2.46. It's continuous. The resistance here is continuously dropping. It's 2.41 ohm, 2.40, 2.39 and as the temperature is going up, the resistance of this material is continually decreasing. If I increase the temperature to quite a bit, So the temperature has gone up to 32 degrees centigrade and the resistance is continually dropping. 2.21, 2.20, 2.19 kilo ohm and so on. So what's happening in this material is that the number of charge carriers is going up. As the temperature is going up, more and more charge carriers are being created. This is a property of semiconductors. We'll learn more about semiconductors. So this increase in n even though there is still a decrease in the average collisional time the increase in n is much larger so this object as a whole decreases so as i keep on increasing the temperature the resistance of this material continuously drops so here i'm at 35 degrees centigrade and the resistance of this material has dropped to 1.87 kilo ohms it started off at 2.5 kilo ohms and it's continuously dropping now so i turn this off and then we move on with our lecture. All right. <clears throat> so what happens is, if you try to plot the log of the temperature, versus the conductivity okay and what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot the log of temperature versus the conductivity why am I plotting the log of temperature because my conductivity sigma is given by apart from the answer my sigma is given by n e square tau over m for a, for a normal resistor, this tau is inversely proportional to the temperature. 
So I have some constant k n e square m into 1 over temperature, right? Now if I would like to plot sigma versus temperature, I would like to have a semi-log plot. I could take the log of both sides, log of sigma is k n e square m log of this minus log of t. Okay, so this is a log log plot. So I have log of t here and I have log of the conductivity here. Now for a metal, for a metal, what would this curve look like? I increase the temperature, what's happening to the conductivity? It's going down. So if I increase the temperature for a metal, I get a relationship of this kind. I am increasing the temperature, the conductivity is uh, sorry, for a metal if I increase the temperature, the conductivity is is going down as it should. So it's correct. Okay? If I have a semiconductor on the other hand, if I increase the temperature, its conductivity is going up. Its conductivity is going up because this end is going up. So for a semiconductor, I have something like this. This is a metal. This is some semiconductor like, like silicon. What about glass? Glass is not a conductor. This is not a conductor. But if you apply high enough electric field, a current can flow inside the glass because this glass has ions in it, has trapped ions in it, which are charged particles. You could have lead ions or potassium ions and those ions are in fact ones that impart color to the glass. You can have colored glass. So the color in the glass comes out because of the ions. So if you apply a high enough electric field, the glass can conduct. So what do you expect of this relationship between the conductivity and the temperature of the glass? If I increase the temperature, what should happen to the conductivity? जो सबसे पीछे बैठे हुए बताएं हम कि ग्लास की कंडक्टिविटी को टेम्परेचर के साथ साथ क्या होगा टेम्परेचर बढ़ाएं ग्लास की कंडक्टिविटी को क्या फर्क पड़ेगा जी क्या होगी क्यों क्या काम होगा Anyone else? Ugly row mein. Ji. N increase ho jayega. Jo charge carriers the, wo zyada mobile hote jayenge. They were stuck in their position inside the amorphous semi-crystalline matrix of glass and they will now become free. If I increase the temperature, they can break the ionization barrier, the excitation potential and they can become free and, conduct to, and contribute to conductivity. So if I increase the temperature, the conductivity of glass will also go up. If I have an electrolyte like sodium chloride, the mobility of those ions will also go up with temperature. So this is what happens for a metal, for a semiconductor, for glass. Now if I have, if I reduce the temperature to near 0 Kelvin, what do I expect for the conductivity of the metal? Unfortunately, the Conductivity does not go to zero when the temperature goes to zero or approaches zero. The conductivity just plateaus off to some value, to some residual value, to some minimum value and it can't go lower. The reason is that even if you reduce the temperature to zero, there are two factors. One is the zero point energy. The ions will still be vibrating with some ground state energy called the zero point energy. You might have learned about it in modern physics. So they will still be oscillating. There will still be a cross section of collusion. And that cross section of collusion will present a target to the electrons and the conductivity will settle at some value. It will not go to zero. The other uh, point is that for metals, no matter how good a metal you have, you always have these impurities. 
inside the metal. Those impurities scatter the electrons. You can have defects in the metal, you can have dislocation, the crystal structure cannot be repetitive. There could be a break in the crystal structure. So these imperfections also cause discontinuities in the conductivity and the conductivity does not really go to zero. However, there are some materials for which the 1986 Nobel Prize were given which have a conductivity which is smaller than metals. You see, conductivity is smaller than metals. At room temperature, they could be insulating. But if you lower the temperature below a certain critical value, the conductivity does indeed go to zero. Uh, infinity, sorry. The conductivity goes to infinity or the resistivity goes to zero. Actually zero. Not really a small value, but actually zero. This is a purely quantum mechanical effect and it's called superconductivity. This is the curve of a superconductor. And I will show you a superconductor in this class. And I will show you what its properties are in a demonstration. So this is how different materials behave as far as their conductivity is concerned with temperature. And there's a huge range of the values of the conductivities. There could be 15 orders of magnitude difference between metals and insulators. So it's one of those properties of materials that show the biggest range. The biggest diversity of materials can be seen in terms of the conductivity or the resistivity. I give you half a minute break and then we'll continue. We have five more minutes so that we can move on. <coughs> These last five minutes are a prelude to your next lecture and I would like you to go home thinking. Now if you have a conductor and there is a steady current, suppose there is a steady current and a uniform current. We already know that the drift velocity of these electrons is going to be proportional to the electric field. Okay, we are talking about electrons so I put a minus sign. And they are going to be parallel, which means that the current is going to be parallel to the electric field. So if the current, if the current is flowing parallel to the length of this conductor, it has to flow parallel to the length of this conductor, then it means that the electric field through this material is uniform. Because if you take an electron here, it has a certain velocity v an electron here at different point on the same cross section will have the same velocity v this will mean that the elect that the current is uniform okay iska ye bhi matlab hai ki the electric field here e is going to be the same in magnitude as the electric field here So the electric field everywhere is going to be the same. So if I plot the electric field along this cross section, if I make vectors electric field, these electric field vectors are going to point in the same direction and they have the same length. So the electric field is uniform across this cross section. Okay? If it were not uniform, suppose the electric field was smaller here and larger in the middle. Suppose, let's propose this possibility. 
Now, if I go from point A to point B to C to D and back. So, this is A, B, C, D. Suppose the electric field is smaller here in this section CD than in AB. Now, if I go from A to B, there is a change in potential. Okay. If I go from B to C, what is the change in potential? Zero, because it's normal. the path is normal to the electric field. So, there is no change in potential in these vertical sides of this loop. There is a change in potential here and a change in potential here. Is the change in potential VB minus VA larger than or smaller than VD minus VC? It's larger because the electric field here is larger. I take the dot product of the electric field with the path. Okay? This path length is the same as this path length. Which means that if I go from A all the way, I suffer a change in potential. So if I go from A to B to C to D to A, I'm not, I return at A, I'm not at the same potential. I have increased or decreased my potential. But that's not possible because if I increase or that's not possible because if I increase or decrease my potential, my potential energy goes, changes. So if I have an electron that is making this circulatory motion inside this conductor, its energy is continuously going up. It can continuously go up, 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 up. And that's not possible because that will mean that violates the second law of thermodynamics. I'm getting energy out of nothing. I have a perpetual motion machine that can do work. And I just have the electron making these circulatory loops and it, the energy of the electron is going up and I can get huge amounts of energy and solve all of my energy problems, but that's not possible. So the electric field at this region must be the same as the electric field in this region if I have a uniform current. There can be cases in which the current is non-uniform. But last point, we've all been talking about electric fields. Where is that electric field coming from inside a conductor? Who produces the electric field? The battery does. Okay, let's think about it. And I'll finish at this question. Suppose I have a battery. Okay, instead of drawing the symbol for the battery, I would like to draw an actual battery. Okay. And I have a bulb here and this is my wire okay so this is a battery isko bade dhyan se sunne ye aakhri do char minute hai jo nihayat ahem hai if there is a current flowing through this wire, suppose I represent this current by white arrows, okay? I am representing the flow of electrons by the white arrows, okay? So at different points along the circuit, this is the direction of the drift velocity of the electrons, <coughs> okay? Now, this means there must be an electric field here, anti-parallel to this velocity vector, electric field here. So, if this were the current, then there must be a blue electric field, right? Electric field everywhere, which is anti-parallel to the velocity. Now, these blue vectors are representing the electric field that must exist around this conductor. Now, where is this electric field coming from? If I need have a uniform current or a steady current and the velocity is constant, the white vectors are of the same length because it's a steady current, it's a uniform current, it's the same everywhere, then there must be the same electric field magnitude everywhere, but pointing in these blue directions. So the blues are the electric fields. Now who produces this electric field? You said the battery. How can the battery produce such an electric field? If this is the positive terminal of the battery. I would say, okay, there's a positive charge here and a negative charge here. Now the point is that can such a charge distribution on the plates of a battery produce such an electric field that I've drawn here? 
it can here the electric field will of course point in this direction but here it will not point in this direction the electric field has to point in somewhat this direction if this were a dipole the electric field here would be pointing in this direction and not in the blue direction here the electric field is uh, if this were a dipole what should the electric field point in it should be actually pointing in ye theek hai ye theek hai yahan pe theek nahi hai theek hai acha dusri baat agar ye ek waqi dipole hai and it is producing the electric field then if i have this conducting path and i bring this conducting path closer i squeeze it so i bring this conducting path like this i shorten the geometry of this conducting path if this were a dipole the electric field here would it be the same as this electric field no the electric field here would be much higher because is a one over r cube dependence due to a dipole if the electric field here is higher the velocity for the electrons in this circuit must be higher which means that the current must be higher and the bulb must glow brighter but does the bulb actually glow brighter no it doesn't if i have okay now another point is if i make a twist here in the circuit and the bulb is actually placed like this so there's a loop let me redraw this loop Now this is my battery. This is the positive terminal of the battery. This is the negative terminal of the battery. Now on this point, if this, if the electric field were produced by the battery, the electric field would be pointing in this direction. But here, the velocity, the current is flowing in this direction. So the current is flowing normal to the uh, electric field. it should not actually light up the bulb because there is no change in the electric potential it the energy the potential energy of this electron does not change when it passes through the bulb it does not do any because this electric field cannot do any work on this moving charge so the bulb should not really glow up but it does glow up so the point at which i would like to finish is who produces this electric field and where is this electric field coming from one question brief question टॉपिक ऑफ टूमोरोज Lecture thank you very much